Wuthering Heights by Emily Bronte. Chapter thirty three. On the morrow of that Monday, Earnshaw being still unable to follow his ordinary employments, and therefore remaining about the house, I speedily found it would be impracticable to retain my charge beside me, as heretofore. She got downstairs before me, and out into the garden where she had seen her cousin performing some easy work, and when I went to bid them come to breakfast, I saw she had persuaded him to clear a large space of ground from currant and gooseberry bushes, and they were busy planning together an importation of plants from the grange. I was terrified at the devastation which had been accomplished in a brief half-hour. The black currant trees were the apple of Joseph's eye, and she had just fixed her choice of flower-bed in the midst of them. "'There! That will be all shown to the master!' I exclaimed, "'the minute it is discovered. And what excuse have you to offer for taking such liberties with the garden? We shall have a fine explosion on the head of it, see if we don't. Mr. Hareton, I wonder you should have no more wit than to go and make that mess at her bidding.' "'I'd forgotten there were Joseph's,' answered Earnshaw, rather puzzled. "'But I'll tell him I did it.' We always ate our meals with Mr. Heathcliff. I held the mistress's post in making tea and carving, so I was indispensable at table. Catherine usually sat by me, but to-day she stole nearer to Hareton, and I presently saw she would have no more discretion in her friendship than she had in her hostility. "'Now mind you don't talk with and notice your cousin too much.' were my whispered instructions as we entered the room. "'It will certainly annoy Mr. Heathcliff, and he'll be mad at you both.' "'I'm not going to,' she answered. The minute after, she had sidled to him, and was sticking primroses in his plate of porridge. He dared not speak to her there, he dared hardly look and yet she went on teasing till he was twice on the point of being provoked to laugh. I frowned, and then she glanced towards the master, whose mind was occupied on other subjects than his company, as his countenance evinced, and she grew serious for an instant, scrutinising him with deep gravity. Afterwards she turned and recommenced her nonsense, at last Hareton uttered a smothered laugh. Mr. Heathcliff started, his eye rapidly surveyed our faces. Catherine met it with her accustomed look of nervousness and yet defiance, which he abhorred. "'It is well you are out of my reach,' he exclaimed. "'What fiend possesses you to stare back at me continually with those infernal eyes? Down with them!' and don't remind me of your existence again. I thought I had cured you of laughing. "'It was me,' muttered Hareton. "'What do you say?' demanded the master. Hareton looked at his plate and did not repeat the confession. Mr. Heathcliff looked at him a bit, and then silently resumed his breakfast and his interrupted musing. We had nearly finished— and the two young people prudently shifted wider asunder, so I anticipated no further disturbance during that sitting. When Joseph appeared at the door, revealing by his quivering lip and furious eyes that the outrage committed on his precious shrubs was detected, he must have seen Cathy and her cousin about the spot before he examined it, for while his jaws worked like those of a cow chewing its cud, and rendered his speech difficult to understand, he began, "'I mun have my wage, and I mun go. I had aim to dee where I'd sarve for sixty year, and I thought I'd lug me books up into garret nor my bits of stuff, and they should have to catch into their selm for the sake of quietness. It were hard to gi up me own Aston.' "'but I thought I could do that. 
but now she's ten my garden from me. And by thy heart, maister, I cannot stand it. Ye yeah, may bend to the oak, and ye will. I ain't known use to it. And an old man doesn't soon get used to new bathings. I'd rather earn my bite and my suck wi' hammer in the road. Now, now, idiot, interrupted Heathcliff. Cut it short. What's your grievance? I'll interfere in no quarrels between you and Nelly. She may thrust you into the coal hole for anything I care. It's no Nelly, answered Joseph. I shouldn't shift for Nelly, nasty old newt as she is. Thank God she cannot stay at soul and nobody. She were never so handsome but what a body might look at her about winking. It's yon flaresome, graceless queen that's witched our lad, we are bold een and her forehead ways, till nay it fair brusts my heart. He's forgotten all I've done for him and made on him, and gone and riven up all row at grandest current trees in garden. And here he lamented outright, unmanned by a sense of his bitter injuries, and Earnshaw's ingratitude and dangerous condition. "'Is the fool drunk?' asked Mr. Heathcliff. "'Hareton, is it you he's finding fault with?' "'I've pulled up two or three bushes,' replied the young man. "'But I'm going to set them again.' "'And why have you pulled them up?' said the master. Catherine wisely put in her tongue. "'We wanted to plant some flowers there,' she cried. "'I'm the only person to blame, for I wished him to do it.' "'And who the devil gave you leave to touch a stick about the place?' demanded her father-in-law, much surprised. "'And who ordered you to obey her?' he added, turning to Hareton. The latter was speechless. His cousin replied, "'You shouldn't grudge a few yards of earth for me to ornament, when you have taken all my land.' "'Your land, insolent slut! You never had any,' said Heathcliff. "'And my money,' she continued, returning his angry glare, and meantime biting a piece of crust, the remnant of her breakfast. "'Silence!' he exclaimed. "'Get done and be gone!' "'And Hareton's land, and his money,' pursued the reckless thing. Hareton and I are friends now, and I shall tell him all about you. The master seemed confounded a moment. He grew pale and rose up, eyeing her all the while with an expression of mortal hate. If you strike me, Hareton will strike you, she said, so you may as well sit down. "'If Ayrton does not turn you out of the room, I'll strike him to hell,' thundered Heathcliff. "'Damnable witch! Dare you pretend to rouse him against me? Off with her, do you hear? Fling her into the kitchen. I'll kill her, Ellen Dean, if you let her come into my sight again.' Hareton tried under his breath to persuade her to go. "'Drag her away,' he cried savagely. "'Are you staying to talk?' "'And he approached to execute his own command. "'He'll not obey you, wicked man, any more,' said Catherine. "'And he'll soon detest you as much as I do.' "'Wished, wished,' muttered the young man reproachfully. "'I will not hear you speak so to him. I've done.' "'But you won't let him strike me,' she cried. "'Come, then.' he whispered earnestly. It was too late. Heathcliff had caught hold of her. "'Now you go,' he said to Earnshaw. "'A cursed witch! This time she has provoked me when I could not bear it, and I'll make her repent it for ever.' He had his hand in her hair. Ayrton attempted to release her locks, entreating him not to hurt her that once. Heathcliff's black eyes flashed, he seemed ready to tear Catherine in pieces, and I was just worked up to risk coming to the rescue, when of a sudden 
his fingers relaxed. He shifted his grasp from her head to her arm, and gazed intently in her face. Then he drew his hand over his eyes, stood a moment to collect himself, apparently, and turning anew to Catherine, said, with assumed calmness, "'You must learn to avoid putting me in a passion, or I shall really murder you some time. Go with Mrs. Dean and keep with her, and confine your insolence to her ears. As to Ayrton Earnshaw, if I see him listen to you, I'll send him seeking his bread where he can get it. Your love will make him an outcast and a beggar. Nelly, take her, and leave me, all of you, leave me!' I led my young lady out. She was too glad of her escape to resist. The other followed, and Mr. Heathcliff had the room to himself till dinner. I had counselled Catherine to dine upstairs, but as soon as he perceived her vacant seat he sent me to call her. He spoke to none of us, ate very little, and went out directly afterwards intimating that he should not return before evening. The two new friends established themselves in the house during his absence, where I heard Hareton sternly check his cousin on her offering a revelation of her father-in-law's conduct to his father. He said he wouldn't suffer a word to be uttered in his disparagement. If he were the devil it didn't signify. He would stand by him, and he'd rather she would abuse himself, as she used to, than begin on Mr. Heathcliff. Catherine was waxing cross at this, but he found means to make her hold her tongue by asking how she would like him to speak ill of her father. Then she comprehended that Earnshaw took the master's reputation home to himself, and was attached by ties stronger than reason could break chains forged by habit, which it would be cruel to attempt to loosen. She showed a good heart thenceforth in avoiding both complaints and expressions of antipathy concerning Heathcliff, and confessed to me her sorrow that she had endeavoured to raise a bad spirit between him and Hareton. Indeed, I don't believe she has ever breathed a syllable in the latter's hearing against her oppressor since. When this slight disagreement was over, they were friends again, and as busy as possible in their several occupations of pupil and teacher. I came in to sit with them after I had done my work, and I felt so soothed and comforted to watch them, that I did not notice how time got on. You know, they both appeared in a measure my children. I had long been proud of one and now I was sure the other would be a source of equal satisfaction. His honest, warm, and intelligent nature shook off rapidly the clouds of ignorance and degradation in which it had been bred, and Catherine's sincere commendations acted as a spur to his industry. His brightening mind brightened his features, and added spirit and nobility to their aspect. I could hardly fancy it the same individual I had beheld on the day I discovered my little lady at Wuthering Heights, after her expedition to the crags. While I admired and they laboured, dusk drew on, and with it returned the master. He came upon us quite unexpectedly, entering by the front way, and had a full view of the whole three, ere we could raise our heads to glance at him. Well, I reflected, there was never a pleasanter or more harmless sight, and it will be a burning shame to scold them. The red firelight glowed on their two bonny heads, and revealed their faces animated with the eager interest of children, for though he was twenty-three and she eighteen, each had so much of novelty to feel and learn 
that neither experienced nor evinced the sentiments of sober, disenchanted maturity. They lifted their eyes together to encounter Mr. Heathcliff. Perhaps you have never remarked that their eyes are precisely similar, and they are those of Catherine Earnshaw. The present Catherine has no other likeness to her except a breadth of forehead, and a certain arch of the nostril that makes her appear rather haughty, whether she will or not. With Hareton the resemblance is carried farther. It is singular at all times. Then it was particularly striking, because his senses were alert, and his mental faculties wakened to unwanted activity. I suppose this resemblance disarmed Mr. Heathcliff. He walked to the hearth in evident agitation, but it quickly subsided as he looked at the young man, or, I should say, altered its character, for it was there yet. He took the book from his hand and glanced at the open page, then returned it without any observation, merely signing Catherine away. Her companion lingered very little behind her, and I was about to depart also, but he bid me sit still. "'It is a poor conclusion, is it not?' he observed, having brooded a while on the scene he had just witnessed. "'An absurd termination to my violent exertions. I get levers and mattocks to demolish the two houses, and train myself to be capable of working like Hercules.' and when everything is ready and in my power, I find the will to lift a slate off either roof has vanished. My old enemies have not beaten me. Now would be the precise time to revenge myself on their representatives. I could do it, and none could hinder me. But where is the use? I don't care for striking. I can't take the trouble to raise my hand. That sounds as if I had been labouring the whole time, only to exhibit a fine trait of magnanimity. It is far from being the case. I have lost the faculty of enjoying their destruction, and I am too idle to destroy for nothing. Nelly, there is a strange change approaching. I am in its shadow at present. I take so little interest in my daily life that I hardly remember to eat and drink. Those two who have left the room are the only objects which retain a distinct material appearance to me, and that appearance causes me pain amounting to agony. About her I won't speak, and I don't desire to think. But I earnestly wish she were invisible. Her presence invokes only maddening sensations. He moves me differently. And yet, if I could do it without seeming insane, I'd never see him again. You will perhaps think me rather inclined to become so he added, making an effort to smile, if I try to describe the thousand forms of past associations and ideas he awakens or embodies. But you'll not talk of what I tell you, and my mind is so eternally secluded in itself. It is tempting, at last, to turn it out to another. Five minutes ago, Hareton seemed a personification of my youth, not a human being. I felt to him in such a variety of ways that it would have been impossible to have accosted him rationally. In the first place, his startling likeness to Catherine 
connected him fearfully with her. That, however, which you may suppose the most potent to arrest my imagination, is actually the least. For what is not connected with her to me? And what does not recall her? I cannot look down to this floor, but her features are shaped in the flags. In every cloud, in every tree, filling the air at night, and caught by glimpses in every object by day, I am surrounded with her image. The most ordinary faces of men and women, my own features, mock me with a resemblance. The entire world is a dreadful collection of memoranda that she did exist, and that I have lost her. Well, Hareton's aspect was the ghost of my immortal love, of my wild endeavours to hold my right, my degradation, my pride, my happiness, and my anguish. But it is frenzy to repeat these thoughts to you. Only it will let you know why, with a reluctance to be always alone, his society is no benefit, rather an aggravation of the constant torment I suffer and it partly contributes to render me regardless how he and his cousin go on together. I can give them no attention any more. "'But what do you mean by a change, Mr. Heathcliff?' I said, alarmed at his manner, though he was neither in danger of losing his senses nor dying, according to my judgment. He was quite strong and healthy, and as to his reason, from childhood he had a delight in dwelling on dark things and entertaining odd fancies. He might have had a monomania on the subject of his departed idol, but on every other point his wits were as sound as mine. "'I shall not know that till it comes,' he said. "'I'm only half conscious of it now. "'You have no feeling of illness, have you?' I asked. "'No, Nelly, I have not,' he answered. "'Then you are not afraid of death?' I pursued. "'Afraid? No,' he replied. "'I have neither a fear nor a presentiment nor a hope of death. Why should I? With my hard constitution and temperate mode of living, and unperilous occupations, I ought to and probably shall remain above ground till there is scarcely a black hair on my head. And yet I cannot continue in this condition. I have to remind myself to breathe, almost to remind my heart to beat and it is like bending back a stiff spring. It is by compulsion that I do the slightest act, not prompted by one thought, and by compulsion that I notice anything alive or dead which is not associated with one universal idea. I have a single wish— and my whole being and faculties are yearning to attain it. They have yearned towards it so long, and so unwaveringly, that I am convinced it will be reached, and soon, because it has devoured my existence, I am swallowed up in the anticipation of its fulfilment. My confessions have not relieved me, but they may account for some otherwise unaccountable phases of humour which I show. Oh, God!
God, it is a long fight. I wish it were over. He began to pace the room, muttering terrible things to himself, till I was inclined to believe, as he said Joseph did, that conscience had turned his heart to an earthly hell. I wondered greatly how it would end. Though he seldom before had revealed this state of mind, even by looks, it was his habitual mood, I had no doubt. He asserted it himself, but not a soul from his general bearing would have conjectured the fact. You did not when you saw him, Mr. Lockwood, and at the period of which I speak he was just the same as then, only fonder of continued solitude, and perhaps still more laconic in company. End of chapter 33 Recording 